Hey, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. Come on. Amen. Last installment today of Battles and Breakthrough. And if you missed any of them, please go check them online because there are three different battlefields that we fight on. And a lot of people don't realize this when it comes to spiritual warfare and the battles that we've, we are fighting. Every single one of us are in battle. And the battles we fight are not against flesh and blood. They're against the spiritual force of evil in heavenly places and heavenly realms. And there's, according to scriptures, three different battlefields. And depending on what front that you are getting attacked on determines the strategy that you need to employ for your victory. So we talked about the first battlefield being the demonic battlefield a couple weeks ago. And for that battlefield, the Apostle Paul tells us, you need to get suited up in the full armor of God. Can I get an amen, somebody? You need to put on the full armor of God. And then what you do to advance against the enemy is actually through prayer. Prayer is where we take the battle to the spiritual realm and through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the only thing that disarms and takes the authority from the enemy is the gospel. That's a demonic battlefield. Last week, we talked about the world, the world we live in, the system of the world that is under the control, the Bible says, of the enemy. Satan is the one who's the influencing power of the world system that you and I live in. It is a battlefield that we need to learn how to fight on. But you don't fight it like you do the other battlefields. There's a specific strategy that we need to employ. And we talked about that strategy, that you actually need to replace the pattern of the world with the practice of the kingdom. There are certain patterns of the world, the customs and culture that we fit right into without even thinking that we need to break the pattern with the practices of Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. That was, those are online, go check those. But today, one of my favorite topics, because I mean, every one of these battles we're fighting on, but this is, I think, gonna be one of my favorite because it hits us all very deeply, I think. I'm gonna be talking to you about the carnal battlefield. Like the, some of you got hungry real quick. You're like, carne, carne asada. Uh, no, no, no. This is like flesh. The Bible says carnal or flesh. It is a battlefield. This is because the battle's not just, listen to me, outside of you, the battle is in you. Okay? It's a battle between our desires and our devotion to God. So here's what I want to do and what I've done every week. I'm going to explain this battle. We're going to expose it. We're going to look at maybe how we're developing and creating strongholds in our life based upon losing the fight in this specific battlefield. So we're going to talk about the battle, and then I'm going to show you specifically for this specific battlefield how to get breakthrough and victory. We're going to start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I got sermon notes for you if you got those as well. Go ahead and open up those. But the Apostle Paul actually tells us that there are three types of people, and he writes about these three types of people in Corinthians. Remember, Paul wrote the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians. He's writing it to a church at Corinth, right? And the, this letter this, that he writes, they're largely corrective, like very corrective letters because, listen, they are dealing with the stronghold that I'm addressing today and we're talking about. They are dealing in the church at Corinth with carnal strongholds. And in this letter, he tells us that there are three types of people in the world. Every person is either one of three types of people. And this is just Paul's language here from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3. Take some notes with me and I'll tell you where we're going with this. You'll see real quickly. The first type of person the Apostle Paul says is the unspiritual person. The unspiritual. So don't say unspiritual. Okay, basically what this means to the Apostle Paul is that your spirit is dormant or dead. See, we are, we're triune beings. You have a body a soul and a spirit, all three different parts of you that collectively make you, you. But that spirit part of you, because of our nature of sin, is dead and has only come alive through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only way that it's come alive, which is why Jesus said that salvation is being born again. And he wasn't talking about being like, like born, born again. He like, in fact, some people had a hard time with that. They're like, what do you mean being born again? How can you go back into your mother's womb? But he was talking specifically about of the spirit being awakened or born again in the spirit. First Corinthians chapter two, starting in verse 14. The apostle Paul says, the person three words in English without the spirit. One word in Greek, it's just sukikos. It literally means, listen, that you are body and soul driven. That's what that word means. 
you live like your spirit is not in the equation based on how you're living. You are a soulish person or a body person. He just said, without the spirit. A person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. Like we can't accept those things from, from God, but actually they consider them foolishness, the things from God, and can't even understand them because they're only discerned through the spirit. So, which means that there are those who are critical of faith and Christianity. They'll always be critical of faith and Christianity because they haven't experienced it yet. They haven't been awakened and come alive to the reality of, of life. The lights haven't come on yet. So they are unspiritual. This is a type of person that the Bible says, and the Apostle Paul says, some people are unspiritual. The second type, the opposite of that, write it down, is the spiritual person. The spiritual. Someone say spiritual. spiritual. Okay, the spiritual person. It literally means that your spirit man, when the Apostle Paul uses this language, it means your spirit man has come alive. That you've been born again. First Corinthians chapter 2 continues, verse 15. But the, the person with the spirit, and again, it's three words, but Greek is just numikitos. Numikitos. It means spirit alive, makes judgment about all things. But such a person is not subject to mere human judgment. Let me say that another way. This person who has pneumakitos, who is with the spirit, sees clearly. That's what he's saying here. You're able to see clearly. Things make sense now because you're able to discern from the spirit realm and from the kingdom of God. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ which is what I hope for every single one of us is that we would be spirit-led people. And I pray that through the teaching of God's word, honestly, your own devotion time, your small groups, that you are learning how to live a spirit-led life. But there's another type of person. That's not all of it. You're like, well, I'm spiritual, spiritual. That seems to be everyone. No, the Apostle Paul says there's a whole other type of person. Write it down like this. It's the carnal person. The carnal person. Because the very next verse, it's a new chapter, but it's the next verses. The Apostle Paul says, and I, look what he says, and I, brethren. Who is he talking to here? He's addressing Christians, the church at Corinth. He's saying, look, my brothers and sisters, I couldn't speak to you as those who have been spirit awakened, as spiritual, because you're not living that way. But I need to address you as people that are carnal. Okay, so your issue, church at Corinth, your issue is not with the devil coming at you your issue isn't with the world around you. Your real issue is, is that you are too carnal. That your spirit man, listen, is not strong enough to do the job that God has called you to do. When in fact, listen to me, your spirit man who has been infilled and empowered by the Holy Spirit is strong enough to do all that God has called you to do. He says, We're, you're, you're, you're carnal. You're babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to uh, receive the meteor stuff. And even now, he says, you're not able, for you are still carnal. What does it mean to be carnal? To be carnal in the Bible, that language, it means just to live by your flesh or natural or sinful desires rather than to be led by the Spirit of God. It's when our thoughts and actions are driven by what feels good in the moment rather than what aligns with God's will. It's, it's carnality is living in the moment, but spirituality is living for eternity. Carnal strongholds, they are the pattern of thinking and our behavior that is so deeply rooted in our lives that it keeps us bound to the same habits, to the same thought processes and mindsets. And these strongholds can be anything from like pride and lust to anger and materialism. But essentially what it does is just prevents us from experiencing the freedom and transformation of walking in the Spirit and living by the Spirit. In essence, being carnal is allowing our flesh to dictate our lives. Here's why. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. For the desires of the flesh, of our carnal nature, are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit, that spirit man inside of us that wants to please God, it's actually against the flesh. They are opposed to each other. And then he says this, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. 
which means for every single one of us, because we all have a carnal nature, we all have flesh, we have a body, mind, and spirit. Every single one of us, we have these parts that we're like, man, I wish I didn't do that. Man, I wish I wasn't that and I was that. I wish I would stop this and start that. That's every single one of us has this tension. And in every one of us, until we understand this, we're not going to be able to get free. So what I want to do is show you the progression of, of carnal strongholds, of how we today, you might be losing the battle and you may not know it that you're even in this battle, but I want to show you the progression that when someone is, is in the stages of carnal strongholds being developed in their life, it always follows the same pattern and progression in our life. And I want to show it to you because some of you are here and you might be in one of these steps already of these carnal strongholds taking deep root inside of your life. And it always begins with this first step. You write this down. I call it like a cycle of destruction. But this first step is where it becomes part of your identity, where the stronghold becomes our identity, it's when that our sin grips our heart so much and so deeply, we start believing that's who we are. So in other words, it's not like just the problem anymore. It's me. It's, it's like, it's me. I can't help it. It's just who I am. I don't think I'll ever get rid of this because it's just part of, it's just part of me. And this is a very, very dangerous belief. I'm going to tell you right now, that is a lie from hell. You are not your sin. You are not your mistakes. You're not your past. You're not your hangups. You are not those. In fact, the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. That the old is gone and the new has come. This is exactly what the enemy wants you to do is to buy into it is your identity. It's a part of who you are. In fact, there's this whole like rehabilitation process. And I don't mean to like hurt anyone's feelings or anything like that. I understand there is, there's, there needs to be a, a process of owning. Like I understand that's a step of owning. This is, this is what I did. This is where I'm at. This is the mistake. This is my hangup. That's very important. But there is this thought process that is contrary to the word of God where some people think when they have a certain stronghold that they got to like stand up in a group and be like, hey, my name is this. And I'm an addict. That's who I am. I'm, I'm an addict. I, I I've been, haven't done it for 47 years, but, but this is my name, and I'm an addict. That is not who you are. I Now, again, I don't mean to hurt your feelings if you said that this last week, even in your group, when you're dealing with that. I get it. We got to take ownership. But you, your identity is not in your issue. It's not in your hangup. It's not in your stronghold. Because when you buy into that, in that stronghold, that that appetite, that nature becomes your identity. It'll always lead to the second step. Write it down. You feel increasingly hopeless. In other words, you think, Jason, if you just come over to my house and just see the collection of books I have on this topic, you think you can stand up here on this stage, preach on this one time, and act like, man, get out of here with that. When's lunch? Oh, come on. You're already checking out on me because you've already fought this over and over and over again, year after year after year. And you're thinking like, there's just, there's just no, no way. And you become increasingly hopeless, hopeless to see your life free from this stronghold. And, and if you're there, it'll eventually lead to this next stage, which is you actually become defensive of the very thing that's taking your life. You start defending the stronghold. You may say things like, you don't, even, you don't know me. I don't have a problem. It's not really that big a deal. I could stop if I wanted to stop. Like, hey, you don't know my, hey, you don't know my past, man. You don't know what I struggle with, man. You don't, you don't know my, my issues. And, and so you can become defensive of those strongholds in your life, which leads to you becoming a slave. Write that down. You becoming a slave to it. It starts telling you how to live. And if we're honest in this room, there's, if we were honest with ourselves and each other, I think we'd say, you know what, there's a few things, maybe just maybe there's at least one thing in my life that bosses me around. Like it calls the shots, it pushes me around when it wants something, it gets what it wants. Like I can't, that's an area of my life that it's hard for me to like deal with, say no to, give it, like, I, like it, every one of us will probably have some areas where we're like, yep, it's dominating me. And, and, and the sad reality is, in, if it gets there, the inevitable next step is that you just begin to lose your life. 
you begin to lose your life. I'm talking about the dreams, the hopes, the promises of God, even in his word. You look at those things, you say, look, it's for everybody else, but it's not for me. And you start resigning yourself to this idea that, that your life will never look like anybody else's life. Yeah, that's for them, but it's not for me. And they'll have that. They'll experience that in their family or in their life and with their kids or with their marriage or with their, they'll have that, but it just ain't gonna be, it ain't gonna be for me. And so we see this progression taking place with, with, our, with our carnal strongholds. And you may be in, in any of those stages right now, but what do we do with it? Because every one of us are dealing with this. We all have flesh. Every one of us has this battle going on. In fact, the Bible is like, does not paint the rosy pictures. I'm, I, that's what I, one of the things I love about the word of God. It does not paint the picture of perfection of the servants, the men and women of God, that they are uh, human, just like us. And the apostle Paul who wrote a lot of the New Testament, let us see some of his carnal struggles himself. He writes about it in Romans chapter seven. Look what he says in verse 24. He said, I've tried everything and nothing helps. Come on, that looks like some of your journals right there. That came right out of your journal, somebody. I tried everything, but nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? But then he goes, the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. Thank God that, that there is a solution to the struggle and the battle inside of every single one of us. Who can help us with this thing that got inside of me? It's living inside of me. It's screaming at me, wanting to take control. Who can help me? Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions. I love that statement, a life of contradictions. We got this battle inside of us. I really want to do what God wants me to do, but I keep doing the things that he doesn't want me to do. Like I want to obey God, but I do the things that don't obey God. He, this contradiction where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Can anybody relate to this? Is Paul alone here? Anyone relate to this? The battle of contradiction inside of us, we know we should do, and yet we don't do it. The very next line, I love it. It's actually in Romans chapter eight. Men put the Bible chapters and verses in there, by the way. When God wrote this thing and the Bible was originally written, it didn't have chapters and verses. But the very next scripture is in Romans 8 and 1, where Paul goes, therefore, there is now no condemnation. Come on, wouldn't you just love for our church to continue to be a place where there is no condemnation up in this place, amen? Where people don't just come in here and put on their Sunday best and act like they got everything together. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, like you just dress the part and act the part and act like you ain't got a flesh like everybody else and you ain't fighting a battle like everybody else. Come on, let's not play the game, man. This is like Let's be real. Let's be honest. You don't need to play that here. You, like, there is no condemnation here. You're free to struggle. We're all struggling. You don't need to put it on and act like it's all together. You just don't. You don't. Years ago, when we first started Discovery, some of you have heard this story. We first started within the first few months. I was doing everything, man. I was like, the janitor, the secretary, the preacher, the, the everything. And so I had, I had the entire phone on my hip. It was back in the day when the phones clipped. You clipped them right here and it was okay to do that and you weren't an idiot. Or, I'm sorry for anyone who's doing that right now. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to say that. It slipped. You just, dang it, I'm sorry, guys. I really am. So that was so wrong. So wrong. So, but I had it right here. Dang. And, and I got the... I had this free Google phone number that mapped to my phone. And, and so I saw it was someone calling the church line on my church line. So I picked up the phone. I'm like, thank you for calling Discovery Church. How can I help you? And it was this woman on the other line that, that asked for counseling. She said, do you guys do, you guys offer counseling services there? And I'm like, we sure do. That's me. I'm it. That's it. You got the right number. <laughs> Here I am. So anyways, I, so I asked her, like, have you ever been to Discovery Church? And she said, well, no, I haven't. I said, well, have you been to, do you, do you, have you been to any church? Do you attend anywhere? And she said, actually, yes, I'm a member of another church here in town in Bakersfield. And I was like, well, wait a second. How come you don't go? I asked her, how come you don't go to the church and talk to your pastors there and get, get counseling there? I'm sure they got counseling there. And, and she goes, oh, no, listen to me. She said, oh, no, they can't know what I'm going through. And I thought, oh, my goodness, therein lies the problem. 
Like, like we're all going through stuff and we don't want to let the very people that God has called to do life with us in on the stuff that we're going through. And until we normalize that we all have a flesh, appetites, desires, carnal battles, you will never fight this battle and get victory the way that God has called you to. This has got to be a place, church, in Jesus' name. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We have been set free by the power of Jesus. Now, every battle is different, right? And, and you got to employ the right strategy to ensure victory. So how do we get victory from carnal strongholds? Let me show you what, what God says in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. He said, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what's right, look what sin, he says, is crouching at your door, meaning this, it is waiting for an opportune time to step into your life when you have let down your guard or invited in. Sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must what? Master. You must master it. So how do we get breakthrough from carnal strongholds? Now, now this is the specific way for this battlefield. This is how you get breakthrough. I can't allow my flesh to master me. I must become master of my flesh. And until you learn this, these, the discipline of this specific battlefield, you will constantly lose to the enemy. You will constantly get, get stolen from. He will steal, kill, and destroy on this specific open door in your life if you don't know how to win against your flesh. The battle inside of you. And whether you realize it or not, it's, it's a lot more spiritual than you realize it's, it is. And I know it's just, it's appetites, it's desires, it's flesh, it's inside of you, but it's a lot more spiritual. In fact, every addiction, every carnal stronghold in our life has its, its roots in this one word. And some of y'all aren't going to like this. It's not in your notes, okay? But it has its roots in this one word called idolatry. Every addiction in your life, every area where we went through that progression right now, and you got some carnal strongholds in your life, you know what it means? It means you have idolatry in your life. Now, I know some of y'all don't like that, but let me explain what, what it means. What does idolatry mean? Idolatry is anything that we allow to sit on the throne of our hearts other than God. Anytime you have an inordinate relationship with a thing, you give that thing power to control you. So it's not just a habit, it's a lust. It's not just an addiction, it's a passion. It's become a place where it's an idol and now it's an open door of spiritual warfare. It has the power to control us. And we're always slave to whatever is on the throne of our hearts. If you really wanna break the carnal strongholds, I'm telling you, you'll be so frustrated with your life until you get this right. You need to settle once and for all, who is king of your life? I'm telling you, you will be frustrated until you dethrone the God of addiction from your heart, the God of your desires and your appetites, and put the true and living God back on the throne of your heart. So let me say it again very clearly. It is spiritual. No, pastor, I just, you know, I like to take a little bit of this every now and then. I, I mean, I got on these pills and I can't get off. It's just, no, 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 no. It's spiritual. It's more spiritual than you think. It gets to a place where you have no power to overcome until you put a new king on the throne of your heart. Amen. So how do we do this then? How do we get breakthrough from these carnal strongholds? Let me give you a new progression that can start today. You've been on a progression of destruction, but I can put in Jesus' name, you can get on a progression of life and victory. If you follow these steps, this is how you do it. How do we get victory? Number one, you gotta start here. You gotta put God first in every area of your life. Put Jesus in his rightful place. This is actually, by the way, what the definition of salvation is. You're not saved when you pray a prayer. Do you know that? You're not saved when you raise your hand. You're not saved when you get baptized. You're not saved when you join a church. You get saved when you put God in the right place in your life. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans 10, we got to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. That word Lord means master, owner. He's the owner of our life. The first of the Ten Commandments, it's why. The very first of the Ten Commandments says this in Exodus 20. God spoke all these things, and he said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, the land of slavery. And then he gives him the first commandment because, listen, God is saying, if you do this one thing, it's going to make all the others a lot easier. 
You can't skip this one. Okay, here it is. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, love nothing else in your life more than me. Did you know God does not mind you loving other things, having other loves? He just minds it when those loves are higher and greater than your love for God. This is actually what Christianity is. If no one has ever explained this to you, please hear me. Christianity is not living a perfect life. It's not attending church. It's not following rules. It's not even someone who believes, you guys. That's not what Christianity is because even the demons believe and they shudder at the name of Jesus. Christianity is someone who says, Jesus, you can take over and put, I put you on the throne of my heart. That's what Christianity is. And the New Testament says it like this, 1 Peter 3, 15. But in your, where? In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Now, practically, how do we do that? How do we, how do we do this in our life? I'm telling you, every stronghold will bow if you very practically, write it down like this, if you just give God the first of everything in your life. Give God the first place. Put him on the throne in every area of your life. When you wake up in the morning, before you check your phone, the news, anything else, check with God. That's first thing. Give him the first of your day. Do you, you know the reason why we worship on Sundays now? They changed it. Early church fathers, and in, 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 after uh, in the time of Acts, the early church, they were, used to worship on Saturday. They changed it to Sunday for this very purpose that it was, it was a principle that you give God the first of everything and I don't, honestly, I don't even understand it completely. I just know God blesses the first. He blesses it. It's holy. It's consecrated. It's set, set apart for him. And if you want to break the carnal strongholds from your life, it must start here. I got to dethrone whatever is there now in whatever area of your life. Because you guys, you guys may compartmentalize your life and he may be first here and here, but over here, he is third place. He may be first in this part of your life, but when it comes to your relationships and your boyfriends, girl, he ain't even on the map. Okay, so I don't know where that came from. That was for someone there. <laughs> Number one, put God first in every area. Once you do that, here's the progression. I'm just trying to help you. Put him first in every area. Then number two, you got to say no to the flesh. Say no to your flesh. And I know that's easier said than done, Pastor. I get it. But, but you're never going to really overcome the carnal strongholds until you learn the discipline of telling that carnal man inside of you, no, no. Right? You're a three-part person. Remember? You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And if you've been born again, that spirit part of you, that's the reason why you're going to heaven. That's the part of you that loves God, loves to obey God, loves to worship God. But there's other two parts of you. There's the body and the soul, the appetites of your flesh and your emotion and mental part. That, here's the thing with these three parts of you. Every single one of them wants to be in charge. And they're all fighting to get their way. And, and the one who is in charge is the one you listen to and give in to the most. That's the one who's in charge of your life. So every now and then, you got to tell your appetites and desires, even if those desires aren't even necessarily bad, you just got to tell that flesh every now and then, no. No. That's why we do like regular fasting. I encourage regular fasting because it puts your flesh in a place where, where it is subdued by my spirit. I don't need to say yes to you. In fact, I'm gonna say no. Even if it, like so every now and then you look at that phone and you've been on the phone too much. You go, you know what? I've been on this too much. I'm gonna put this away for a week. I'm not on social media too much. I'm gonna put that away. I'm gonna get off social media for a week because I'm just not gonna let it master me. It's not gonna have mastery over me. I was at, we were at BJ's with my family this last week. And BJ's got a good dessert menu, y'all, and I have a sweet tooth. We're sitting there waiting to go in, and it's got the Pazuki advertisement right there. And I'm like, it's going down. <laughs> Pazuki day. And I'm like, so I sit down, and I'm like, I ordered the, the least calorie salad I saw on the menu because I'm getting a Pazuki later for dessert. And I'm telling you, this salad was the grossest, driest, most terrible thing I've ever tried to stomach down in my life. I didn't even finish this thing. It was like bad. And I'm like saving room like, yeah, I'm going to be, because I'm getting a pizookie. But I felt like, I felt the spirit of God. Just, I'm telling you, I've been, and this is just for me. I don't know about, okay. God, I've been saying yes to sweets a lot. 
In fact, I ain't said no in a long time. And so, so I just felt like this is, this is getting out of control. I was too excited for this mizuki. This was, this was. So I felt like, no, 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 if I keep feeding this thing, if I keep feeding my flesh, this thing is going to get real strong and it's going to start bossing me around. I just felt like it was teetering. And I know it started with maybe sweets, but when you feed the flesh, it's, it's all of its appetites will, will master you. And so when the waitress came around, I was just like, any dessert today? I had to close that menu like, mm, no. Got mad at that waitress. No. I rebuke you. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that to her. I didn't say that to her. I was nice to her. But here's what I'm just saying. You got to say no. You got you to gotta learn the discipline. I'm saying, because some of you, you ain't said no to that thing in a long time, dude. In a long time. Some of you, it's been years. Because the problem is, some of you don't even think you can say no to that thing. Romans chapter 6, here's what Paul says. Therefore, do not let sin reign. Don't give it the place of leadership in your life, in your mortal body, so you obey its evil desires. Don't offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God for sin shall not be your master. Now, sin doesn't reign, listen to me, unless you let your flesh rule. When you give it rulership, that's when sin reigns in your life. And we have a choice. We either feed our spirit or our flesh. We either serve God or serve sin. How do we do it then? Galatians 5, 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have what? We killed it. Yeah, you, you don't work on your sins. You crucified that thing, man. Crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Here, let me just state it simply. Write it down somewhere. Whatever I starve dies, and whatever I, I feed thrives. The battle is won in what you feed. Whatever you're going to feed the most is going to have rulership in your life. So what do we do? We put God in first place in every year of our life. And then what we need to do is say, start saying no to the flesh. And then once we do that, I'm just giving you a new progression, man, of victory in life today in Jesus' name. We're going to get victory over our carnal strongholds in Jesus' name. All right? Once you start saying no to that flesh, here we go. And these things don't need to be in order. They could be simultaneous. But here you go. Number three, share the final 10. Share the final 10. I'll tell you what that means. But the Bible tells us that healing actually begins when you start being honest. James 5, 16 says it like this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. That means this, I got junk and you got junk. And you're gonna share your junk, I'm gonna share my junk. We're gonna share our junk together. And then you're gonna pray for me and I'm gonna pray for you. Why? So that you may be what? Healed. Healed. So I'll tell you where Share the Final 10 comes from. Years ago, I did a, a small group with a group of guys and there was a bunch of guys who came, but six primary dudes were there over the course of several seasons. One guy left the group, moved out of town, his, his work, you know, transferred him. And, and so three months after he transferred, he gave me a call on the phone. He said, hey, Pastor Jason, I need, to, I need to come honest with you. When I was in the group with you, you know, last year, I, I, uh, I was honest with 90% of my struggles. Partial obedience, that's what that is. I was honest with 90%. But I need to share with you, he said, the final 10. I'm addicted to pornography, and I've been addicted to pornography since I was a child. And I don't want this to dominate me anymore. I need to bring it out in the open. What a scary thing. What, but, but here's, I was so powerful, my conversation with him. He, after the conversation with him, he just, he felt so much freer and lighter. That thing, this is what James is saying about confessing your sins to another, so you may be healed. What he's saying is, take the final 10 out of the darkness and bring it into the light. And every single one of us, we all have a final 10. We all have, because it's, be, it's easy to be honest with the 90. It's like, oh, yeah, pray for my marriage, man. Yeah, my marriage is, you know, we just, we need some help, you know. Everybody needs some help. Pray, pray, hey, yeah, pray for me, bro. It's a, it, but that final 10 is hard because, we, like, we're afraid that if you see this final 10, man, this is, I'm ashamed of my 10. I'm, I'm ashamed that if you saw this, it'd be worse than yours. Like, I got a worse, I got a worse 10 than you. And I'm going to get judged for this and, and, and rejected 
for this if you knew it was real. And the enemy, listen, the enemy has lied to you, hasn't he? Because he's actually convinced you that for you to be accepted, you actually have to stay bound. That is a lie of the enemy. Because the only way for you to be free is to take your final 10 and bring it into the light, to confess and pray for each other so that you actually can get healing and victory in that area. So let me give you a few steps here to walk this out, to share the final 10. Number one, I want you to get into a small group, church. Get into a small group. These aren't just activities for you to be busy with. You need to get around brothers and sisters in Christ and start doing life with the right people because who you share that final 10 with is very important. It's very important. You need to get connected to a group. They're open right now. Our registry is open. You go online, find one that's right for you because they launch in two weeks. Get connected to a group. And then number two, once you do that, we got to create a climate of acceptance, Meaning, this is our culture here at Discovery, and I want you to own it and embrace it when you step into that, that group. We create a climate of acceptance, meaning, you, un, I understand, you all got junk up in here. Even that leader hosting it, he got junk too. She got stuff too. I got stuff. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have grace for your 10. You have grace for my 10. I'm going to love and embrace and wrap my arms around you. You're going to love and embrace and wrap your arms around me, and we're going to get healing together. That's a climate of acceptance. Join a group. Create that climate. And then number three, keep it in the room. Like, there's got to be a, a level of confidentiality and trust that's there. But let me give you a little bit of wisdom, because what I'm not saying is week one of your group, air out your final 10. That would be really stupid. Okay, just don't do that, all right? Here's what I would suggest, though. What I would suggest is you find in at least one person that, that, you know, you click, you see. They're sharing, and as they're talking and you're talking, you're like, all right, that's, that seems like a person for me. And you just, after the group, you pull up to the side, say, hey, what's up? Hey, can we connect? I'd love to connect with you and just kind of share a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. You exchange those numbers, and you open up to that one person before you open up to the, to the group. You, know, you just... It's just not wise. I'm trying to help you with healthy boundaries here. I do want you to open up, but I want you to be wise about how you're opening up and who you're opening up to, all right? Now, don't use that as you're like, oh, I got to keep it in the dark thing. Pastor Jason just gave me permission to keep that thing in there because I just don't trust him. That's your problem. <laughs> you got to trust somebody. You got to, I know it's risky. I know it's scary. And you're not going to have a perfect condition and a perfect person. They got junk too. So if you want to be free of the carnal strongholds, if you do, there's a different progression you can start, a victory, and start winning on this battlefield, breaking carnal strongholds. Put Jesus, come on, put God first place in every area of your life. He's going to be first. We're going to say no to the flesh, share the final 10, and then lastly, number four, fight for freedom. I got to start fighting this battle. I need to start engaging this battlefield specifically today. I need to start engaging the fight against my appetites, against my desires, against the nature of my flesh because this is a real battle I'm facing every day and I'm gonna fight for my freedom. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Remember, this Paul's writing to the letter to this church that is dealing with carnal strongholds. This is who they are. He can't address them as spiritual. He's gotta address them as carnal. And in that, to that church, he tells them how to break these strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, for though we live in the world, we're not going to wage war as the world does. I'm not going to fight these carnal strongholds the way everyone else does. Oh, get the right habit app. Get, get, act, get on the right diet plan. Get, get the right, dude, I get all that stuff is great and all, but that's not how you win spiritual battles. We're not going to fight the way the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So here's the thing. We're in this battle. And the enemy wants to steal from you and the enemy wants to kill you and the enemy wants to destroy you and he wants to isolate you. So this is what he does. Listen, he's gonna give you a little bit of porn. He's gonna give you a little bit of debt. He's gonna give you a new card in the mail. You've been pre-approved and you're like, yes. He's gonna give you a little bit of food that you love and a little bit more of that food than you actually need. He's going to give you a relationship that you can't get out of. And that person just keeps coming back into your life. And he's going to give you stuff that satisfy your cravings, that satisfy your appetites. And this is what he does. He'll give you the stuff that satisfy the flesh. And then he walks away and he's watching you and he's smiling and he's thinking to himself, well, now I can just sit back and watch them kill themselves. 
Because on this battlefield, there is no binding and loosing that will set you free. Okay? You cannot, I like to say it like this, you can't disciple a demon and you can't cast out a discipline. So some of you trying to bind and loose and cast out things, you're on the wrong battlefield. You're on the wrong battlefield. The door that the enemy actually came through was through your flesh. So, so how do we fight for freedom? As I was praying for you, I felt like, the, I felt like God gave me a word today for, for whoever's listening, okay? This is, I believe it's prophetic. I believe it's Raymond because there are some, battle, some, some tools that he's caused us to do battle with. And I've written about those and preached about the different tools and the weapons of our warfare. But I felt like there was a few specifically that God wanted me to give you today. Some weapons today. That he wants to speak into your, into your life and your situation. I want you to receive this today. The first weapon I think that we need to fight with you guys is, write this down, irrational obedience. <laughs> irrational obedience. Do you know we serve an irrational God? Like our God is really irrational. Like he sent his one and only son to earth to die. That's very irrational. He asked Abraham to kill his son. Now, he didn't, he didn't, end up, he didn't let him do it, but that's pretty irrational, okay? He asked Peter to walk out on water, which does not make sense, but it's irrational obedience, and it's irrational obedience that leads supernatural results. Sometimes God calls us to act in ways that don't make sense to the world, but that's where the power is. It's in the irrational obedience to the Spirit of God. And here's, I believe God has been, he's been telling some of you to do some things that you just, it don't make sense. Like he's been telling some of you to, to go on a fast and to stop eating as much as you've been eating. Because the appetite of your flesh is dominating you. And you need to fast. You never fasted before. It's irrational obedience. Some of you, he's telling you, turn off that TV. Cancel your subscription. Oh, man, I, I like my program. I mean, he's telling you to put down the phone or social media for a season. Some of you, he's telling you to end a relationship. I'm not talking about your marriage, by the way. I always have to make that distinction because sometimes people will receive it and be like, that was the word I needed. I said like 45 minutes of everything, and it's like, that's my word. No, that's not your word today. Some of you, the word, maybe God's telling you to stop spending. Cut your credit cards. Cut them up. Cut them. Oh, rely on those things. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Here's, here's where I think God is leading us today, and what he wants to tell you is, like, when you start fighting for your freedom, it's through irrational obedience. God wants to speak into your life, into your situation, onto this battlefield, and show you how to get victory, okay? Irrational obedience. The second thing is I, I think God wants you to reestablish the confidence in his word, that you, as a man and a woman of God, can put your confidence in the Word of God. Hey, can I just say something about that? Stop reading devotionals and read the Word of God. Some of you are reading devotions and think you're spending time in God's Word and you're spending time in somebody else's thoughts about God's Word. And now I'm not against the, I love devotion. I've written devotionals. I love it, but it's supposed to be supplementary. And some of you are using it as your daily bread. And that's not life. That's not bread. That's like, I don't know what that is, man. I don't know. Side, side plate? What do you call that? I don't know. You know what I mean? That's some corn on the side. You need to get some, you need to get the word. You need to get the meat in your, you need to get the word. Because that word has the power to heal you. That word has the power to save your marriage. That word has the power to save your kids. That word has the power to save your soul. That word is going to tell you you're more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That word will tell you that. You need to get it from the spirit of the word. Not from the spirit of somebody else's word. So go ahead and read a devotion. Don't get me wrong. But if you're using that, as your devote, no, no, you need to get back to confidence. You having confidence in the word of God. And then lastly, we're going to fight through consistent prayer. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing for all things and all occasions. And there was a time in my life, I'll admit with you, I was a weak prayer guy. I liked the word of God and studying the word of God, but I just didn't realize that this is actually where the fight is is fought. We battle in heavenly places, and that is only accessible 
in prayer. That is where I must engage in the fight is in my time of prayer. And we need to become people of prayer to fight for our freedom because it's not with the weapons of this world. Before you close up, let me just give you one last verse. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I just want you to receive this. Here's, again, remember, the Apostle Paul's writing to carnal Christians. Christians who have their spirit man awakened, they love God, but they're just living very carnally. Remember this, he says, the wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new and different. Many others have faced exactly the same problems before you. Let me say it this way. Your 10 ain't no different from somebody else's 10. You ain't got it any different than anybody else. And no temptation is irresistible. There's no temptation in your life. There's no appetite. There's no desire. There's no temptation that you say, I will just never be free of this. I will always have come back to this. I'll always, maybe I'll do it for a little while, but I'll always come back to this place. No, there's no temptation that is irresistible because you can trust God to keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can stand up under it or against it. He's not gonna remove you from temptation, but he will give you the power to stand up against it. For he has promised this and will do what he says. He will show you how to escape temptation's power, not by removing you from this world, not by removing you from your flesh, but so that you can bear up patiently against it. Well, how, does he, how does he give us that? How is he gonna give me the power? Because up to this time, it hadn't worked yet. You gotta start a different progression, child of God. You have to start a different progression. You have to put Jesus on the throne of your heart in every area of your life, in every single area first, in your relationships first, in your career first, in your family first, in your parenting. No, I'm not gonna follow the model of this world. I'm gonna follow, follow God's word. In your finances first. In every area of your life, he's, he's first. I'm not going to leave any door left open. He's going to be first. That, that's how. We start, we start this, this new progression by putting God first in our life and starting to say no to these appetites of our flesh. We're going we're gonna to share the final ten and these secrets and these things in the dark. We're going to find someone, at least one person, to share it with, and then we're going to start fighting for our freedom with some irrational obedience. I'm telling you, no temptation is irresistible. You're not perfect. God is never, he's not asking you to be perfect. But that spirit inside of you can do a whole lot more than you're living up to. You're living by the lies of the enemy instead of the fruit of the spirit. And it's time to be free. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.